Welcome to Mind Echo. Join us as we delve into Neville's original lectures and books. In this video, we harness AI technology to recover and enhance Neville's voice, guaranteeing unmatched audio quality and clarity. Today, we're excited to present his remarkable lecture titled Forgiveness and the Immortal Eyes. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the wisdom of Neville Goddard. Tonight we'll take two aspects of the great mystery. One is forgiveness, and the other is the immortal eyes, the eyes that really see. He said to them, when one or two are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them also. Then Peter said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? He said, 70 times 7, Matt 18, 21. This is something you and I must practice and practice daily. But how many know the art of forgiveness? Repentance and faith are conditions of forgiveness. But really, forgiveness, if you look at it, there is no worldly wisdom in it. We all know that. Then what are people Christians for? The story itself makes no sense. The story of Christianity and its doctrine, none whatsoever. Well then, what are we Christians for? When you read the promises made in Scripture that the dead shall rise into an entirely different world, clothed differently, it doesn't make sense when you see it all turn before you into ash as the body is cremated. Yet man is called upon to believe the story of redemption. So here is the only way a man can forgive it, learn to distinguish the eternal human that walks about and among these stones of fire in bliss and woe alternate from those states or worlds in which the spirit travels. This is the only means to forgiveness. I must learn to distinguish between the state and the occupant of the state. If I can see the most horrible acts in the world, knowing that that is an actor and the script is written for him, if he is cast in that role, he has to play that part. If there's any condemnation, it must be to the author who wrote the part and not the actor who is playing the part. So here, if I can distinguish between states and the occupants of states, then I can forgive. Now, how do I forgive? By identifying the one that I would forgive with the ideal that he has failed to realize. The highest ideal would be to identify him with the divine image itself. When we are told, let us make man in our image. Well, now that image is the image of God. It's called in scripture Christ. To take a man unknown in the world that is condemned by the world and still identify him with the image that is Christ, that radiates and reflects God. That doesn't make sense. Yet I am called upon to do it. I must actually identify him in my own mind's eye with that divine image. But I could fall a little short of that and take an ideal that he has failed to realize. The ideal, well, in his own world of Caesar, it could be that he is affluent, or at least he has an income equal to his responsibilities, even though he has nothing, and identify him with that until I am strong enough to go beyond the barriers of appearances and see him as really the divine image itself. Well, I am called upon to set this in motion and to practice it, and not only practice it, but to talk about it and tell it. So, when the statement is made, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. In the Mishnah, which is a Hebraic work interpreting scripture. It is said that if two sit together and there is no word of the Torah between them, they are seated in the seat of the scoffers. As it is written in the first Psalm, blessed is the man who sits not in the seat of the scoffers, but rejoices in the law of God day and night. For that man shall prosper in all that he does. 1.1. 1 .1. 
So they associate this with the first psalm. If a man who does not discuss the Torah, the law of God and his prophecies, though he is known and a brilliant mind, he is actually seated in the seat of the scholars. Now we are told in the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, we read it in the third chapter. If two fear the Lord, and the word fear means to reverence, to respect. If two respect and reverence the Lord, they will discuss his word and they will talk together. Those who talk together, discussing the word, then the Shekinah, which means the glory of God is between them. Well, you can say the whole vast world certainly is not filling that bill. You think of a cocktail party and who at a cocktail party is discussing the word of God. They look upon you as something that, well, was just dragged in. I mean, if perchance this thing happened, what on earth did you bring him to the party for? Go to a dinner party. I recall that about five years ago, I was invited to go to the mosque. This friend was just initiated, he's now a member. And the man who just recently died, Alan Mowbray, was the head of the party. Just one joke after the other, and each getting more and more into the gutter. So we sat there, and we had a certainly nice dinner, and they're all telling jokes, and they called upon me to tell one. So I excused myself and said that I love a joke, but I'm not a good storyteller, not of that nature, although I love jokes and I'll listen to you all night. But they insisted that I would say something. So I rose and I told them about the law. Now Mowbray played successfully in over 300 pictures. He certain didn't need any instruction from me concerning success, for he played in over 300 pictures and numberless TV appearances and a man of means in the world of Caesar. And so, when I got through telling him of the law of assumption, an assumption though false, if persisted in Will Harden into fact, and I'm addressing this bunch of actors, then Mowbray had to naturally say something after the stranger spoke. For I was the stranger, the invited guest, and he said, I didn't realize that we had invited one of these long hairs here tonight. And that was his attitude toward the word of God. Well, now he just departed this little sphere. He'll find himself restored to life that I do know from experience. And he didn't know it before departure. He is restored in a body just like the one he wore only young in a world just like this terrestrial, but without his background or the money in the bank that he left behind him. In this world of ours, we leave all these things behind. We take our consciousness that we do take, the knowledge of what we have done and who we are, but we leave things. In this world, if I give you something, I lose possession of it. If I sell you something, I lose possession of it. That's not so in the heavenly world. In the heavenly world, I can give you my eyes and keep them. And the eyes remain yours to use as you will. And then you can give these eyes that I gave you to another, and yet you keep the eyes. It's a world of sharing. Not one thing is lost in heaven. I can give you everything that I know and give you every faculty that has awakened within me and it becomes yours if I give it to you and you will use them and then transfer them to another or give them to another and they will use them. It's their possession to use just as they will. But now we come to the immortal eyes. A week ago tonight, two ladies who are here tonight were in their car driving home and then they parked the car when they got to their place. At least that's what's inferred in the letter. They undoubtedly were discussing what they had heard a week ago tonight. I couldn't tell you what I had said a week ago tonight, but suddenly 
one to whom I gave my eyes two years ago, and by eyes I mean my immortal eyes, she had this vision. It was a true vision that I took my eyes out, came forward, and put them right into hers. It was then, or soon thereafter, or just before, that in a vision she was told that she is an incurrent eyewitness. Well, an incurrent eyewitness. The word incurrent is to give passage to a current that flows inward, like the pores on a sponge where it draws it inward. But I've told you time and again, concerning this golden liquid light, how it works. Blake made the statement, how they came forth from the furnaces, and how long, how severe the anguish ere they find their father, were long to tell. Jerka, plot 73. No, it doesn't mean that I, as a man, was on any cross that was burned. It could have been, but that's not the story. Yes, man's inhumanity to man has revealed that many of us in the Inquisition say were burned alive to satisfy some sadist who thought he was serving God. But that's not the vision. The furnace on the cross. This body is the cross, and the furnace is the furnace of experience. When we have completed the journey, having played all, we are reduced to the stump. And you are told in the book of Daniel, do not touch the stump, leave it alone. Strip the tree, throw the fruit away, sever the branches, cut it down, but leave the stump, 415. And from that stump, the new being grows. That being is golden, liquid light, and that is the blood of God itself. That rises into what? They asked Paul, and Paul said in his 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, someone will ask, how do the dead rise? With what body do they come? And he answered his own question and said, it is as God has chosen. Conceive of an infinite being, not big in the sense of taking up space, but a being that is perfect, that could contain all humanity. In that one body, as you're told in Ephesians, there's only one body, one spirit, one Lord, one God, and Father of all, 4-4. Four, four. So in that one body is a body that is unique for every being in the world. What it will be like, who knows? But you will fill it with yourself. That is the golden liquid light. It takes the molten gold to be cast into that form, and you rise up like a serpent into that heavenly state and you empty your being that is all molten gold, which is the result of your experiences in this world. This world is a furnace, the furnace of experience, and it is far more burning than if tonight you were consumed in a flame, for that would take only a matter of moment. Take yourself now and douse yourself with gasoline and set yourself aflame. It wouldn't take long to depart this world, but to remain in this world and live, and then to depart it normally, or even in violence, to find yourself restored to life in a world just like this, with problems just like these, to continue the furnaces to the very end when you are reduced right down, and there's only yourself left, and that self is that liquid molten gold. And when it rises, you will rise as it, you rise into the mold, waiting for you. That is the body that God has chosen for you, and it is unique. There is no one who can fill it but you, and it is waiting for you. So, everyone in the end is redeemed in the one body, the one spirit, the one Lord, the one God and Father of all. So in the end, we are not anything that is here. Paul made it so distinct. Don't try to compare the mortal frame that you wear here with that which is your immortal self. It is planted a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. It is planted in weakness. It's raised in power. It is planted in dishonor. It is raised in glory in a translucent state. So everyone here will go through these experiences. I don't care what they will say. So I give my eyes to one 
in my spiritual world. Having been risen from this state, it is my choice, my privilege, to give it to whom I will. To her I gave them, and she in turn gave them to one who now sits next to her tonight. And this is her. Having heard her relate the vision while seated in the car, this other lady who heard them as they were being told went to bed that night, which is a week ago tonight. And in this she said, I saw a match scratched upon the earth and then the whole earth burst into flame as far as the eye could see. That horizon was like a prairie fire in Kansas. If you've ever seen the flatness of Kansas, when the sun comes up in that vast, vast prairie flatland, that whole thing is simply like a flame. So she said, it looked just like the flame of Kansas when the sun is rising. And then some dark object came out of what seemingly was the center of that flame and came straight towards me, an enormous object, and it was a serpent. It came straight to my nose and then turned to my left. And then what I had not seen before was a cross. And the cross rose from the earth and became erect. That serpent transformed itself into a man, and the man climbed up on the cross. But instead of being on the cross, he was in the cross. She actually saw the transformation of a serpent into a man, being transfigured on the cross from within it. And the whole thing was aflame. So here, they paralleled each other in the vision of the night. So what I've told you is true. You have immortal body, a body that is imperishable. In this world of Caesar, we are fighting shadows. We think the other is another, and there is no other. There is only God. There's only one being in this world. So here I am, looking out upon a world that seems to be multiplied by billions of people. Each seems to be separate and individual and distinct and may be an enemy of mine. There is only one being in the world, and that being is God. God fragmented into all of these little garments. In the end, it is gathered together. And in the end, only one being, yet without loss of identity, for you are individualized. But the body that you are going to wear is not this. Yet, may I tell you, I will know you, and you will know me. So having been raised from the dead, when I presented myself to her and to others who have been attending, they knew me, but I can vanish from them at will, appear at will. Others will see me in different characters. You become a protean being, but you can't show them that body until they arise to where you are. That is something that you can't display to anyone. You can display the fact that you have risen from the dead. But then man not understanding this, he thinks, well now, when Neville dies and they cremate him or they put him in the grave, will he reappear to me? That's not resurrection. Resurrection takes place while you are here. This world is the world of death. Everything here is dead. As the thing that he wrote, have you ever thought of it, that all of our food is dead food? We have to kill the animal. Therefore, it's dead before we eat it. Whether it be a bird or whether it be a fish or the vegetable or the fruit, everything is dead that we consume and the world is the world of death. So he overcomes the last enemy, which is death. So we go out fighting against shadows and we think he is another or she is another. They are not others. We are all brothers, and collectively, we form one being, and that one being is God. We are the sons of God, but it takes all the sons of God to form God. He is made up of all of his sons, and God is housed in his sons. Say, I am. That's God. That is the one and only God. There is no other God. That's his name forever and forever. Now, if I would forgive you, I can do it only as I keep in my mind's eye the difference between 
what you are doing and who you are. I must learn to distinguish between you, the immortal you, and the state into which you have moved, either wittingly or unwittingly. So as Blake said, you can see from what I teach, I do not consider the just or the wicked to be in a supreme state, but to be every one of them states of the sleep into which the soul may fall in its deadly dreams of good and evil. This of last judgment. Take your mother that you love. No matter what your mother did, if you really love her, what would it matter to you concerning good or evil? Wouldn't you forgive her? I wouldn't care what she did. I had my mother. She's gone from this world now. But I'm quite sure that if mother were here in this world and she did the most horrible thing, I could forgive her. I could forgive any of my brothers. I know that much. My mother, my father. Learning now to put my circle further out to encompass my friends and then to encompass a larger circle. Those that I do now know as friends. For in the end, we are all one being. We're all brothers. So he said, go and tell my brother, I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and to your God. Here is a man who pushed out the circle to encompass all because he realized there was only one being in the world playing all the parts. But I can't forgive unless I can discriminate between the being who occupies the part that he is playing and the part that he is playing. Then I can identify him with the part that I know he would like to be. And to the degree that I am self-persuaded that he is that, he will become that. So it is entirely up to me to practice the art of repentance. Repentance is not what the churches teach. Repentance is simply a radical change of attitude. So I see it. It's obvious. There he is. He's committed the act and he confesses to it, but it doesn't matter. So he's confessed to it. He was in a state when he committed that act. Now I must learn to separate him, the actor, from the part that he was playing and identify him with the part I know in my heart he would like to have played. And as I am persuaded that he is that being, he changes from the outer world into that state and becomes the transformed being that others may see it. So I am called upon to practice repentance. For the first word recorded in the earliest gospel, that is the earliest by actual date, which is Mark, is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. 115. Believe the most incredible story that was ever told to man, the story of Christianity. It doesn't make sense. And so, if you are going to judge it on a human level, well then, it is complete nonsense. Worldly wisdom should throw it through the window, and yet I'm called upon to believe it. So if I believe it, I must now put it into practice. If I call myself a Christian, what are people for if they aren't going to practice it? So I either practice it or just take the word just as a name and say, I'm a Christian. We go look for a job or you're inducted into the army and they ask you that question, what's your religion? And you say, I'm a Christian. They're not even satisfied with that answer. You've got to tell them what denomination. You say, I'm a Christian, but that's not good enough. Are you a Roman Catholic? Are you a Protestant? That's not good enough. What denomination of the Protestant? And all this nonsense they ask you when it's simply, I'm a Christian. Well, what is a Christian? The fulfillment of the promises of Jehovah to man, to what is called Israel, through his prophets, his servants, the prophets. Christianity is only the fulfillment of Judaism. So if I said to her, who asked me the question, I'm a Jew, then she would assign me to a rabbi. But I said, no, 
I'm a Jew for the simple reason I'm a Christian. I could be a Jew and not be a Christian, but I can't be a Christian and not be a Jew because Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism. So how could I be a Christian and not be a Jew? I would have to be a Jew first before I can be a Christian. And so if I actually unfold the story and I experience Christianity in myself by reenacting within myself the entire story of Jesus Christ without thought, it just happens. If the whole thing unfolds within me, then I am the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel and fulfillment of that promise is Christ. Now go and tell the story to the whole vast world, at least to those who will listen, to those who will hear you. And then when you are moving in your heavenly sphere, you select from wisdom that is from above, not from below. For on this level, if I had to give my eyes to one, I would definitely give them to my wife and next to her, I would give them to my daughter. But on a higher level, when there is no uncertainty as to whom you should give it to, I gave it to another. I only know this lady at a distance. I've never seen her home. I know her husband. I've never seen her children. I only know her in this place. I know her. I love her like a sister, but I certainly have never seen her socially, never met her socially, only here. And yet the one person on this level to whom I would have given my eyes if I used this wisdom and this feeling, it would be my wife. Following my wife, it would be my daughter. Yet when you are functioning from above, you aren't using the wisdom of Caesar. You are seeing it entirely differently and you select from those who come the one to whom you will give it. And then the gift is so complete, she can do with it what she will. I'm quite sure she would have given hers to her husband or her mother or her children. She has two, but she didn't. She gave it to one who is not related as the world calls relationships in this world. You do it from above. You don't give the gift from here. But fortunately, the gift that you give you retain, you do not lose it. In fact, by giving you have increased it within yourself and your visions are altogether wonderful and they come when you least expect them. When you are in the theater and you're seeing a crowd, suddenly you've dropped out and then these things are happening within you. You are at a cocktail party and you don't go into any meditation or this nonsense of going off to some little place in India or some fella coming over here with his long beard that should be washed. Have a beard, but why not keep it clean? And then he goes off and takes $500 from each person. If you can't afford five, he'll take three. Then who is kidding whom in all this nonsense? And he's going to teach you how to meditate. You don't have to be taught how to meditate. When the visions come, they just come and you can't stop it. And when you have been placed upon that cross and this body is the only cross Christ was ever placed upon. It is Christ in us that is the hope of glory and this is his cross. The prairie fires that she saw and her friend to whom she gave the eyes saw. The fires are the fires of experience. These are the furnaces. As Blake said, how they come forth from the furnaces and how long, vast and severe, the anguish before they found their father were long to tell. That's the one goal in this world. Man is seeking for his father. His father is not an earthly father. His father is himself. The father is the cause of his own experience in this world. He is looking for the cause of the phenomena of his life. Why are these things happening to me? He is trying to find out why. And when he finds the cause, he's going to find himself. And that cause is the father. And he is the father. So you can say, I and my father are one. 
page in 1030. He must find the father before he finishes this search in the world. So how long, vast and severe, the anguish before they find their father was long to tell. No one can tell you how close you are to the discovery of the father, but it will begin with your resurrection while in this world. And soon after your resurrection, which is the same night, you are born from above. And then days later, to be exact, 139 days later, you find the father. Then 123 days later comes the splitting of the curtain of the temple, which is your own body. And there you see what the lady saw, that liquid molten gold. And then like a serpent, as you fuse with that gold, you move up like a serpent back into your own skull, which is heaven, Luke 17, 21. Then 998 days later, the dove descends upon you because the whole thing is over. And here, the spirit of the Most High has rested upon you, Gen 1, 1, 31, 34. Then you can say, as it is said, when he begins the story in Luke, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has anointed me now. This is the anointment. And he has sent me to preach glad tidings to the poor and to open the eyes of the blind. 418. We all think we see, and we think the blind are those without eyes or impure eyes, so they can't see. No, we have eyes and see not. We do not see the mystery behind this facade. So tonight, learn to forgive. It is essential. And you can only forgive when you can start to discriminate between the state in which a man is placed and the man who is the occupant of that state. If I can discriminate between the two, I can forgive any being in this world. For if I am cast in the role of a murderer, I've got to murder. If I'm cast in the role of the wonderful person, I must be that being. But if you like the part I'm playing, all praise belongs to the author and the author is God. So he wrote the play, and then we are the actors playing the parts. And in the end, when the curtain comes down, we will understand the reason behind the entire play. Now let us go into the silence. 